it is a great honor for me to welcome you today on this first of a number of series of training programs that JSIA is planning to do it in the form of two days, three days, four days, workshops, etc., and to satisfy also on this the needs of diplomats. Myself, as a former diplomat, Chargé d'Affaires to Cyprus for seven years, Chargé d'Affaires to India for four years, Ambassador to Jordan for five years, and also Deputy Foreign Minister of Syria for European Affairs. My colleague, the Ambassador, we had a very, very fruitful and very useful, you know, cooperation and understanding when he was in his position and I was in my position and hopefully we can do it. And before I uh, give a brief thing about JJJJU and JSIA, also what makes this JSIA a very distinguished is among the very renowned, well-known uh, professors, faculty members, having long experience in the field of politics, in the field of international relations, diplomacy, law, business. Also, Professor Mohan Kumar is a well-known Indian ambassador to a number of countries who will speak for himself when he will be coming welcoming you. So we are here to learn from each other, to see what our, for example, although our university is just 19, 2006, then 2009, but up till now, it is not surprising that its ranking is 250 one out of 3,000 universities, you know, which is a quite very good. If it means anything, it means the seriousness of the people who are in charge of managing, administering, follow-up, and it also means that the interdisciplinary thoughts that we are teaching in the various fields with the help of also a number of foreigners coming to India to interact. So interaction is very important. As I said, this is the first, but not the last. Thank you for joining this. The topics that have been, that will be covered during today and tomorrow are really very, very important. When I was here and anywhere, I really wanted to know what is the foreign policy of the country, of the host country, what it works, how it works, how it interacts, and to prepare a report and see the shortcomings, etc. Here, we are not speaking only, we are not speaking politics, you know. We are trying to see how, from the perspectives of science, political science, international relations. India is a great country, nobody wonders. And even President, former President Clinton, when he decided, it happens, when he decided to impose sanctions against India due to the Bukhran, you know, nuclear test, he couldn't help but say, I have decided to impose sanctions on this wonderful country. No wonder, wonderful country from the psychological point of view, and he went on to say, yes, I still remember the feelings and emotions and passions of myself, my family, and my daughter when we visited India. So there is a personal thing in this. Richness of diversity, culture, and here, greatest 
democracy. I'm not going to speak further. I will leave some, you know, for my uh, colleague, and we will be meeting tomorrow about speaking India and the Middle East in one part, you know, which is very interesting because you know what's happening. India can play a very important role. Why? I will tell you tomorrow. I will keep it till tomorrow. And uh, this, as I said, is very important interaction. Please feel free for any questions, anything, no embarrassment. We will see what we can do. And I take this opportunity again to thank all those who are organizing this international office under the guide of Professor Galliani and also with the coordination of Professor Mohan uh, Kumar and hope we can be useful to each other. May I ask Professor Mohan Kumar just to say also a few words on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I think uh, my colleague has covered most of the ground. I'll just say the following. I, I retired just six months ago as India's ambassador to Paris. So I would want you to make use of my uh, experience of 36 years in the Indian Foreign Service. Um, Chatham House rules apply, otherwise I will get into trouble. We have a cooling off period of one year in the Indian Foreign Service. After August, I become a free man, but I'm not yet a free man. I'm still sworn to Official Secrets Act, which is common in all countries. But I think uh, what I wanted to say was the following, really three brief points. One, if you belong to a small embassy or a small mission, I think uh, a module like this becomes absolutely critical. I wish uh, when I was posted as India's ambassador to Bahrain in particular, Somebody did this for me, because I had never served in the Gulf before. Most of my um, postings were in Europe. So when I was posted as India's, and by the way, the Indian Foreign Ministry is as, uh, shall we say, logical as many other foreign ministries. You speak French, they will send you to Bahrain as ambassador. Okay. So I think it's better, some of you are young people, so you better get this straight. If you think that you do French and you're only, I ended up as ambassador to Paris, but that was an accident, not by design. So. So I think it would have been wonderful if somebody had done this for me, just to understand what I now believe and I know to be the most complex region in the world, Middle East, without a doubt, without a doubt. And yet I was posted there uh, by the ministry without any training. I did not know the language. I suppose they considered me reasonably intelligent. So they just promoted me as ambassador. I was sent there. That was the toughest posting for me, frankly. So actually, when I started discussing with my colleague Abdul Fattah, I said, uh, initially we thought this should be for newly arrived diplomats. And, and uh, you know, at the risk of being frank, I mean, I come from India, and, and the most difficult thing is to be objective about your own country. It's not easy, because you know, you're either very patriotic or you swing to the other extreme and you're very critical. I think India is complex. Uh, that goes without saying, and most of you will agree with me. The second thing is that most of you are either unlucky or lucky. I think lucky more than unlucky. You are at a time when India's foreign policy and India's trajectory is not even clear to me. So I don't know how the hell you guys are going to figure out. Frankly, I'm an Indian. I'm supposed to know this country very well. And I think it is a very, very important moment where shifts in pol foreign policy are happening almost every six months, every one year. And we can talk about this very frankly, obviously subject to Chatham House rules. If you belong to a big embassy, on the other hand, let's say, I think they're not here, but let's say the American embassy, for example, which has got hundreds of diplomats in Delhi, then I think the utility of this course is because I would hate for you to be second secretary or first secretary without knowing the big picture. You may be doing a small part of the job. That's fine. All of us have done that before we become ambassadors. You have to go through the grind. You have to do commercial work. You have to do consular work. You have to do political work. But I would hate to be doing political work in India without knowing what is India's approach to economic diplomacy. I think the two are related. So as a, an efficient diplomat who is ambitious and 
and, and most of you are career diplomats anyway, I think you need to know the whole picture, the big picture. And our attempt in this particular module is to try and present the big picture where India's policy can be better understood and interpreted by people like you. So that's really the purpose of this uh, module. I don't want to carry on too long except to say that we are happy to get feedback from you. We are also relying very heavily, heavily on you to spread it by word of mouth so that people understand. We are happy to do this every three months. If you think two days is too long, we can make it one day. If you think two days is too short, we can make it three days. If weekends are better, tell us. Because you are the first, if I may use the expression, guinea pigs. You will have to get back to us about being honest. And, and tell us if it's bad, it's bad. We can take it. It's not a problem. We can take it in the chin. If it's bad, it's bad. We will accept it and try to be better. But on the other hand, the timing, um, the, the, the extent of discussions that we need, I think we will appreciate this kind of feedback. It will be extremely useful for me and my colleagues just to know how to make this much, much better. And uh, just wind up on this one note. Um, I have realized, and I, was, I think I've spent too long in this business of being a diplomat, and I've retired now. So uh, I, I think I know enough to know that nothing is really non-political. That is the first really lesson that you should learn as a dip, especially in a country like India. There is nothing like consular work and economic work being non-political. That's a load of rubbish. Everything is political. H-1B visa is political. That's why we are negotiating with the United States. WTO negotiations, and my forte, I have to say, is WTO. I spent 10 years in Geneva as India has negotiated with the WTO, and that's why we will be talking about economic diplomacy this afternoon. And I realized soon enough, I was surrounded by a bunch of people from the Ministry of Commerce who kept on telling me, you are wasted here. You are a diplomat. You don't know a damn thing about WTO. What are you doing here? I said, I will prove you wrong. And eventually, what I realized in Marrakesh, Seattle, and Doha, and I was fortunate to be represented in all the conferences, ultimately, you need input from diplomats. It is the commerce guys who don't know what they are talking about. They have some very, very good people, no doubt about it. But it is, what I'm saying is, just as Winston Churchill said something, and I'm going to paraphrase him, trade and consular work is too important to be left to trade and consular people. You know what I'm saying? Ultimately, it is diplomats. Ultimately, it is diplomats who have to provide that political input. So this is, as I understand it, the attempt from the Jindal School of International Affairs to one, give you a big picture, second, to help you try to understand this jigsaw puzzle called India. I say this very honestly and frankly, because it, it can be difficult sometimes to understand. And thirdly, we do seek uh, genuine, honest feedback from you so that we can try and do a better job. I, I, I believe before we break off for a cup of coffee or tea, might be useful to just hear from you even at this point so that some of us can at least tweak our talk to you. We should have done this much earlier, but it was very difficult getting in touch with you. So maybe if you don't mind doing that, just give us a sense of what your expectation at this point is from this course, and then we can take it from there. But as I, my colleague already said, we are very, very happy and grateful for your presence. And uh, the, the only thing that we can promise you is that we will do everything in our power to make it worthwhile for you. Thank you for being here.
for example, yeah, go ahead. And please introduce yourself. You are trying to turn us into well-rounded experts, so I think it will be after the course if I should be able to say that something was missing. But but as of now, I think it looks really really great. Thank you. What are the typical challenges of being a diplomat? Not in terms of living. I don't want to get into that at all. I'm talking about the challenge of, um, I think I should, I'm used to speaking without a mic as you can see. No, I think the challenge is more trying to understand the vast labyrinth of bureaucracy and trying to know where to get information. Is that a problem for you? We are thinking that at least for the next course uh, we, can in, we can include that. We, did, we were not prepared for it this time. For example, I wanted to... Um, convey to at least smaller embassies um, the key people in the Prime Minister's office, the external affairs ministry, how it works, because the Ministry of External Affairs has become fairly big now, and we have all sorts of divisions there. I thought I could, uh, the Ministry of Commerce, and what are the things on which the external affairs ministry trumps the Ministry of Commerce, and what are the areas in which the Ministry of Commerce tells the Ministry of External Affairs to take a hike. This can happen. It's a turf war in every, in every single country. So are you interested in these kind of things at all? But maybe I should let you guys speak. Ambassador, thank you. And thank you for being here, sir. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity to, to share my views before we have uh, uh, started and eventually exhausted the program. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, I warmly welcome and appreciate your words about uh, the importance of the political and diplomatic uh, function. Um, coming from, uh, from the same uh, background, I, I could only admire somebody uh, speaking in a loud voice that uh, consular and economic uh, and cultural and all other activities are uh, um, so important uh, to leave them to cultural, uh, consular and economic uh, people. Thank you very much for uh, this support, uh, professional, if I may say, support. Secondly, uh, to mention about uh, the program, I have uh, had the opportunity to take uh, other uh, training programs, actually. I'm not saying I'm addicted to that, but it's always nice from time to time to escape from the office and to go back to to the academia, and uh, this is the first time that I see in the program issues uh, such as uh, Pakistan and China included, so uh, good for you, I welcome that. I uh, appreciate that uh, we shall have a frank uh, discussion on that, and it would be extremely helpful. Uh, it is uh, in a slightly uh, different area, but uh, still I am referring to, uh, to, uh, to your talks. I wouldn't surprise you if I tell you that uh, in my uh, personal experience, I had a colleague who has uh, graduated uh, from, uh, from the university with an excellent knowledge of Japanese language. Later on, he was recruited in the foreign service. Uh, he has worked for, for the whole of his professional career in many other countries from Asia. Uh, I met him many times in the ministry. Uh, I knew about him working in Iran, in other countries. Eventually, he worked uh, for my directorate dealing with disarmament issues. But uh, there is also a positive thing that at the end of his career, uh, he is now being posted to Tokyo. So the logic of the diplomatic service is the same uh, everywhere. Uh, before concluding, and sorry for being uh, uh, so uh, talkative, uh, for the small embassies, uh, I come from a small embassy, such a training pro uh, program would be extremely uh, useful. Our biggest worry is that uh, in Delhi, the diplomatic life is extremely busy. You have uh, many things, uh, you have many events, you have many processes to follow. And uh, some of us, if not all of us, again, I'm, 
I'm referring to the small embassies. We need, we need such a guidance. And once again, I thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you very much for those words of support. And in fact, I must be honest with all of you. We had at least 50 people, 5-0, who expressed tremendous interest. And really, the hall should have been full. The problem is, as you said, many of them said you have chosen a working day. Uh, that So my question to you, Ambassador, and then we can go around the room if you want. Do you think weekend is better? We had this discussion internally, and there was this point of view that diplomats need their weekend for recharging their batteries. You know, you work hard, presumably, huh? uh, from Monday to Friday. Uh, it's very hard to make, it is very hard for other sectors of the government to make them understand that diplomats work hard. It's, it's a major problem. Uh, in India, it is a very big problem. Uh, if you're posted, especially in Paris, Washington, Geneva, what we diplomats used to say, the Elizabeth Arden circuit, it's very, very difficult to make people understand that you're working very hard in Geneva. Whereas Geneva is the most miserable posting for anybody. If you are, take your job seriously, you will be working from 9 to 9. And because of the time difference, you finish the poster, I mean the meetings at 6, you're still sending reports till 9. So it's actually turned out to be, in my case anyway, it was a bad posting. Paris was much better. But anyway, what I'm saying is, weekend we discussed, but then we thought, oh my God, weekend is the only time the diplomats have, you know, with your families and so on. So we didn't know what to do. So finally we took the plunge and we said, okay, let's have it on 21st, 22nd. Now, Ab Abdul Fatah, I don't know if you want to add. Well, actually, this is uh, exactly being, as he said, diplomats from diplomatic backgrounds, knowing how hard diplomats work from Monday to Friday, and that the weekends would be spent at least with the family or with the friends to have energy for the next week. So having, so we took this venture, yes, let's, the decision was there. Let's, let's make it during the working days. And working days, diplomats, yes, this is a part of the work of the diplomats just to know and to gather information and to get an analysis, uh, which really such very short two days uh, condensed lectures, uh, talks, interactions would help diplomats to get update information and analysis of what other things, uh, how, whether that would be useful or not. And uh, we are open, but uh, in, in one of the questions, whether uh, Professor Mohan has said your impression about India working in India, what are problems, what are grievances, if any. You know, I'll tell you what happened when I was, I was supposed to go ambassador to Washington, and for one reason I came as here and then to Jordan. And my wife and my kids, my children said, you're going to India? I said, yes, oh my God. So when we arrived in India, my wife started crying. She doesn't want India, she wants to go. And you know, I cannot say no to her, and I cannot say no to two things. I cannot say no to God, because he will take me to hell, as people believe. To intelligence, they can take me to prison, and maybe to Guantanamo or whatever. And if I say no to my wife, she will sack me out. So I said, OK. She put your wife ahead of God. <laughs> <coughs> so I said, okay, let's think how and where, you know, to go back. I will ask the government any diplomatic way. Of course, I cannot do it. And this is one of the, when we used to recruit diplomats, we used to ask questions, are you married? Oh, yes. How is your relation with your wife? Oh, my God, this is a personal thing, sir. I said, yes, but just. If somebody says it's not good, we say to him, sorry, you are not a diplomat. The diplomats are to solve problems, are to help, are to do, and in this. So my wife, 
I said to her, okay, I will work for it as you want it, but give me some time. I have to consult the government and to look for a better place. So this is diplomatic mind. This is, and this is, everything is politics. And then in the end she got, yes, okay, okay. When we were, you know, leaving India by the end of the tenure, she started crying. I don't want to leave India. So it is really sad that those who first come to India, knowing to a new world, large world, they feel, oh my God. But when they leave, they yin to India. So India is great. And, ah, and this we can continue, you know, on a personal uh, talks for the breaks and have the coffee and we can know much better. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for giving us the opportunity also to meet. Thanks.